Hello, my name is Rebecca Tapp. Welcome to season two of the Decoding Purpose podcast, The Turning Point. In this season of the Decoding Purpose podcast, our intention is clear to decode the turning points that catalyze purpose so we can empower conscious choice over crisis and ignite conversations that change the world. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to episode two, season two of the Decoding Purpose podcast. I'm going to kick off today's podcast with a quote by Steve Jobs that I love. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life or karma. The reason I bring up this quote is is because when I interviewed today's guest, I suddenly felt conscious of the fact that I was in one of those looking backwards moments, that the person sitting there across from me in the studio was not only a person of influence, but a person who influenced my career in ways I could have never have really anticipated upon meeting them. Why is that, you may ask? See, I've spent most of my career working alongside some of the world's best thought leaders. They have all had influence, but there were a few that also created epic social impact. Today's guest is one of those people. I first met Peter Baines in my early 20s and his presence in the formative years of my career in the speaking industry was, in looking back, probably one of the main influences in my life leading to the passion that I have today for really understanding and decoding purpose-driven influence, the kind of influence that changes the world. Pete's story also happens to be just a little bit jaw-dropping. Why? Because investigating homicides, leading international teams into scenes of crisis and disaster is not your typical path to becoming a keynote speaker. Then again, Pete learnt about leadership on the front line, which is exactly why he's one of Australia's most prominent keynote speakers today. Pete worked on the ground after the 2002 Bali bombing and the 2004 Boxing Day Thailand tsunami where his life changed forever. This was the turning point that ignited Pete's purpose, the creation of Hands Across the Water, a charity on a mission to provide children in Thailand with a life of choice. Welcome to the podcast, Peter Baines. Oh, it's great to be here, Bex. Long time coming. It has been a long (laughs) time coming and well worth the wait. Absolutely. So, Pete, I I want to start off with a question that I ask every single guest on the Decoding Purpose podcast. Over the course of your life, have you lived your purpose? Because you have made an intentional decision to do so where purpose was your choice, or do you think that purpose has been a kind of fate or destiny that's played out in your life? Yeah, good question. I think the um, when I reflect on it, it's more the clarity of purpose for me has been something that rather I rather than setting it and then pursuing it, rather I look at the pattern of my life uh, retrospectively and I can see that there's a, a theme around the purpose. Mm. And, uh, and certainly as I've got older and, and life has changed in what I do, I see that um, I'm more aligned to it and it's more obvious now. And uh, uh, then early on, but there's certainly that consistent theme. So the the, the next question is, well, what is it? And it's, it's for me, it's about being uh, providing answers and uh, having worked as a forensic investigator uh, for uh, twenty odd years with New South Wales Police. I reflect on that now, and and the purpose of what I was doing was to provide answers to families, uh, those who were the families of uh, homicide victims or uh, provide answers at coronial inquests or judicial inquiries or trials or so forth. And so I see that was what um, uh, I did within the forensic area Mm. and then certainly working beyond that, uh, my role now is still to provide uh, answers, but the questions are different. And uh, so I think that that's the consistent purpose and And as I say, it's clearer now than what it was, but there is that consistent theme when I look retrospectively. Mm. 
Yeah, there's a great uh, quote by Steve Jobs saying you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect Mm. them looking back. Yeah, nice. So, Pete, you completed your studies as a young man, which I know you didn't enjoy too much. Mm. Um, And from there, you decided to become a forensic police officer, which means you spent a lot of your time working in the crime scene division and dealing with violence, death, and I imagine some fairly tragic circumstances. That's a lot to deal with for a young guy. When you reflect on that time, what do you think inspired your decision to go into the police force? Yeah, I I guess it wasn't. I didn't go through school thinking I wanted, I wanted to join the cops or anything like that. There was no burning ambition. I, I uh, went to uni after school because I got the marks, but I didn't have, and funny, this is what we're talking about, I had no clear purpose as to mm. what I was studying or why I was there and and therefore uh, that meant that, um, you know, there was no focus and quickly realised that um, that wasn't going to work for me, so left and and uh, just found employment and then decided to apply, join the cops and, and, um, and got in and loved it and worked in uniform um, in Western Sydney for about four years. And, and then part of it was, um, I, I, to be honest, I got sick of dealing with domestics and drunks mm. and uh, thought there's got to be something more to this. And, and uh, then there was an, an opportunity to join the crime scene unit and I'd always found the investigation of major crime and homicides and suicides and so forth and deceased interesting. And uh, so joined the forensic area and, and then that became a career, being a, 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 a practitioner within the crime scene area uh, and then going into senior leadership positions both uh, uh, within New South Wales Police and then nationally as well. Mm. And, Pete, in those early days, whilst you might not have been able to consciously uh, express your clarity of purpose, mm. Do you remember having a feeling of purpose, having that kind of innate motivation and drive? Oh, absolutely. You know, like I, I can reflect on uh, the work that I did and, and no different than any job. There might be uh, 80% of your career which kind of blurs into insignificance almost because it becomes the same. And, uh, and I can reflect on a number of uh, key um, jobs that I was involved in as a forensic investigator and um, and one in particular, uh, a homicide investigation that um, wouldn't be known because it was, and sadly a reflection of society, it was a, uh, it was a domestic homicide, but, um, um, and the offender had uh, uh, cleaned up the crime scene and buried the body of his wife uh, some uh, 20 k's out of town, and this was in the town of Tenerfield. But the reason that job was so significant was because we spent days at the scene doing trigonometry on the blood splash pattern that he'd attempted to clean up, and the whole case hung on the forensic evidence. There was no witnesses, mm-hmm. there was no admissions, there was nothing other than forensic evidence. And and that today remains a job that uh, I feel like was one of the major accomplishments that I had. And I did jobs where there was multiple homicides. I did a lot of international work and and uh, and so forth. But it was those type of jobs where you look retrospectively and say, but for the work we did, this person wouldn't have been prosecuted and the victim or the victim's family wouldn't have got the justice. So, yeah, mm. absolutely. So even though it was challenging, the accomplishment of, of being able to push through something like that and and solve the problem and give the answers mm. uh, in coming back to your purpose was what well, really... Well, yeah, I think, the, yeah. You, know, you, you know, if we're not challenged in what we do, mm. then it can just become pretty... Um, pretty, I guess, uh, um, um, almost boring and, and repetitive. And that was one of the things I loved about the work in the forensic area was the was the difference that we encountered each day. And uh, um, and and in a week week that went past, if I wasn't investigating death, it was an unusual week. Mm. But um, it was the variety and the complexity of some of the jobs that we did. Um, that really um, made you feel like you were making a significant difference. And to the families, uh, we were. Mm. 
So, Peter, as I mentioned to you uh, before we started the podcast today, this is season two Mm. of the Decoding Purpose podcast. And the theme I have chosen to explore in 2020 is turning points. Mm. Now, the reason for that is because in having hundreds of conversations about purpose, I've found that more often than not, people find meaning in significant turning point moments. I know you have had several turning points, which I'm sure we will talk through in the course of this interview. However, in researching for today's podcast, I stumbled across an incredible interview with the lovely Ali Hill that you did last year. Yeah. And you reflected uh, on an occasion in the police force where you were called out to a farming accident. Mm. This was a poignant experience for you. Mm. Are you able to share with our listeners that story with a focus on how that experience shaped your purpose? Yeah, it gives me goosebumps when you bring that up. But it was, um, again, not a job that would have made headlines anywhere. It Mm. was uh, sadly another common occurrence of uh, farming accidents and and fatal farming accidents. And and we did too many of them in in my 10 years at at Tamworth um, with um, uh, people... Uh, on farms who take shortcuts and and um, feel the need to get the job done and don't have people to assist and uh, but the job you refer to was uh, there was a chicken influenza that went through the uh, the poultry industry in Tamworth and uh, some large producers uh, up there and uh, um, they had to cull all of their stock and it, during this time uh, they were clearing out the sheds. And uh, uh, Laurie, who was um, who was subsequently killed, was driving a tractor in between the sheds, and uh, um, and for whatever reason, ended up behind the tractor. The brake wasn't on; it was on a on a hill, and uh, he was fatally injured uh, by the tractor rolling back over him. and And we don't know whether he saw the tractor, tried to stop it, or or whatever, but. Um, he was killed as a result of that. Um, but the point you refer to is uh, I was called out as a forensic investigator and uh, um, arrived at the property and it was uh, uh, Laurie's pro- uh, parents' property. So I had no awareness when I turned up what I was uh, going to other than a fatal farming accident. And the Ambos had co- covered him with a sheet as they do out of respect for the family and and uh, I turn up and the first thing I do is remove the sheet because it's something that's um, been placed there after the incident so it has no relevance to my work. And as I pulled it back, I recognised it was Laurie who was a family friend and his wife um, uh, was, was my wife's best friend. Our kids were uh, about to start school together and, uh, and it was her birthday and... Uh, and and I guess um, the significance of it for me was that um, I did the job there. I did the investigation, then I went straight to uh, Louise's uh, house, and uh, and she asked that I be the point of contact through the police because I was well known to her and Laurie's family, rather than them having to deal with someone that they didn't know and. The coroner said he was fine, that I I do that. So it was unusual for me to take this role well beyond the forensic part where I then was interviewing uh, witnesses and putting the brief together for the coroner. Mm. But I guess the point you, why you raised that is what I learned out of it was I'd got to the point where, as I previously said, investigating death was a weekly occurrence. And I would turn up and if there was a suicide or a suspicious death, I then assumed that the family would understand the next steps, understand why I was there, understand what would happen when the body was collected by the funeral directors. And I assumed that because it was something that was so common to me. But working with um, the family and uh, and Louise through that, it gave me this great insight to remember the significance of what we were doing, the impact that we were having and the opportunity that we had with every family uh, to leaving an impression and uh, and that they didn't know the next steps. And I guess I'd got um, uh, my, my level of perspective was out of kilter because mm. it was so something so common to me 
yet so foreign to everyone else. Mm. Uh, so that gave me a lot of insight and it really then helped me moving forward as a real reminder of what we're doing and to take time to share that with the families uh, that I then encountered uh, beyond that. And, look, I mean, the other component to that is you over your career have, you know, you've been asked to really face and stare down death. And for many people that is a really intense thing to consider, especially when it's a part of your everyday job. That said, I imagine in confronting death at that level, you would also realise in, in a really in a real way, how fragile our lives are. And in addition to that, the significance of our contribution in our life, our Mm. purpose. So, Pete, I'm wondering, can you talk me through your personal connection to purpose as the active creation of our life legacy? Yeah, it's probably a bit deeper than what I am. Um, You know, a lot of the stuff that I've done and uh, particularly what I do now has been because it's it's made sense to me. Yeah. And as we started and with, uh, as you said, with the, the quote from Steve Jobs is we can only connect the dots in the past. And, mm. uh, and I guess it's uh, something that um, what I've done, um, particularly in the last uh, 15 years or so forth um, and around what might be the, the legacy and so forth, was it just made sense and then it just grew. And uh, I didn't start with uh, what I've been doing to to think about, well, this will create a nice legacy or this is on purpose yeah. or this is what I need to do or this will counter the death that I've seen by doing this. Mm. It was just something that, um, you know, I'm a pretty simple person and um, and there was an opportunity. I saw the opportunity. It made sense. I started. And, you know, to be honest, Vex, it was probably with a lot of naivety. Mm. And uh, and if I'd imagined uh, or had an insight into, uh, you know, the, the challenges right then, you might not have done it. But uh, there was a level of ignorance and, uh, and uh, as I say, naivety that led me to, to do what I do now and uh, that, you know, others might judge is the legacy. So, Pent. Pete, you spent two decades as a forensic investigator and in that time you worked in countries following a major crisis, including Indonesia, Japan, Thailand and Saudi Arabia. I know that your time in Bali after the bombings was uh, an extreme environment to be in, even with your experience in the police force. You were staying in a guarded hotel where the police force were on the receiving end of death threats uh, in an unknown and highly predictable, envi- highly unpredictable environment. What I'm interested to know is how do you process fear, anxiety, and all of the natural survival instincts telling you to get the hell out of there when the purpose and the greater mission is to stay put and get the job done. Yeah, it um, Bali was uh, certainly an interesting um, and challenging environment. Mm. It was uh, it was the first real international deployment of significance. It was certainly my first international deployment, and you don't join the the, the police in New South Wales working in the crime scene area thinking that you'll you'll deploy overseas, but. Um, um, after the bombings, uh, I went to went to Bali uh, shortly after the bombings, and and I guess um, the, the the point that you refer to around uh, the feeling of fear, I was standing outside the Sari Club, uh, standing on the other side of the this massive crater in the ground where uh, the old three hundred Mitsubishi van had been filled full of explosives, and um, and after it was detonated. It, um, caused the fire and the subsequent death of so many of the 202 people who had been in the in the Sari Club or had ca- came who came out of Paddy's Bar and um, and I was standing outside the uh, or within the crime scene tape and um, we're on the edge of this crater and uh, um, and uh, doing the the work that we were there to do and a, a motorcycle pulled up. Uh, and uh, this guy jumped off and walked with purpose directly towards us. Mm. And uh, 
had a helmet on, a backpack and was dressed in long clothes. And, you know, that was exactly um, what happened in Paddy's Bar. Uh, a motorcycle rider dressed just as I've described with a backpack walked into Paddy's Bar and uh, detonated a device which claimed his life and also many around him. And it was certainly that uh, point in time uh, that I felt, uh, um, whether it was justified or not, felt this fear of, well, is he here to do what's already occurred? Because uh, as you as you said, the, we were receiving death threats at the hotel. Uh, we, we weren't allowed to leave the hotel. There'd been threats if... If we were found, the police were found out on the streets that there'd be kidnappings and so forth. And each day we're travelling a different way to the, the hotel as um, as a safety uh, protection. So it wasn't as though this was an isolated incident. There was this was background everywhere. information and mm. we weren't wanted in the country. You know, there's no question that uh, uh, our pro- presence wasn't welcomed by everyone. But... You know, your question of how do you process that, I, I guess. Or even focus in that. Yeah, I guess like it was, a, as I say, whether it was a, a rational or irrational fear, it um, um, within, uh, I guess, 30 seconds or so forth of him standing there, I realised, well, uh, if it's something was going to happen, it would have happened and it didn't happen. So mm. he wasn't there to, to create harm. He was a, a, a local um, observer who was looking at what had happened within his country. And so I guess the how do you process that? Well, it's um, bringing a rational thought process back to it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's not like we were uh, working in areas such as like the defence or so forth who are un- under constant threat. We were there, um, you know, the, the, the level of security um, in uh, the, the areas, and it's, it's normally the case you see uh, in, a, in, a, in an area anywhere around the globe um, immediately after a terrorism incident that security is at its highest and uh, you're probably the safest in, in an area, whether it be after the bombings in Sri Lanka recently or in London after the, mm. the stabbings and so forth. You, you're probably the safest in that immediate aftermath because there is so much security personnel that are in that time. So it's it's bringing that uh, rational thought um, into it and then having that, you know, clarity of purpose around what you're there to do. And, and of course, if you don't want to be there, you don't go. Mm. And, uh, and we had more than one person who turned up who um, just couldn't deal with the, the circumstances that we were in. And uh, and they returned to Australia, but uh, you know personally, it always felt whatever deployment I did overseas, it always felt like a great honour. And um, you know, if you look at it from a sporting com- uh, uh, metaphor, you, you know, if your team's in the grand final, you want to be there. You train all year, you play all year, you work all year. Sometimes you can go your career without getting there. So. For us, this was the biggest job, Bali and then Thailand, that we would ever face. Mm. It was unprecedented that um, uh, New South Wales police would deploy into a, a Bali for the bombings. And I remember sitting, talking to a, a, a police inspector from Victoria, Greg Hoff, in Denpasar Airport as we're leaving the bombings and uh, leaving Bali. And, and I said to him, Greg, this is the biggest job we'll ever do. And he said, absolutely, 202 people had died. But it was only um, it was only a short time later that we were then in um, uh, Thailand dealing with five and a half thousand bodies. Mm. And uh, um, but uh, um, yeah, I guess it's that bringing that rational uh, perspective as to where you are and what you're doing and and having that focus. And and as I said, you know, we all were there by choice, and mm. uh, and we were all keen to go back. And it was one of my jobs was to select the teams to go from New South Wales. And and if we had 10 positions, we had 100 people that wanted to go. Was it the kind of thing that would, would hit you when you were back on Aussie shores in that you had to be so logical to deal with it at the time that once you got home and you were safe, did you find the emotions would, would well? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's um, one of the things I used to say to the guys who were after deployment mm. when they were coming home was not everyone will be interested in what you've done and mm. uh, you want to come home and you want to talk about it. And 
no different than going on holidays, you know, like you remember the days where mum and dad would go and, you know, fill up uh, their camera with photos, come home and have their slide projector and as kids you'd be locked in to watch these photos and uh, I'm not sure if John and Anne Taft did that to you, <laughs> Bex, but... Uh, they did, yes, the VCR. Know, <laughs> there you go. But, yeah. you know, it's always more interesting to the person that's there. And so for us coming home, um, there were people who were really interested in what you'd done, but there were also people, and particularly colleagues, who didn't get the opportunity to go, and therefore there was a level of jealousy in some point that they didn't want to hear because it's what they missed out on. Mm. But I think coming home... As I say, it's a really good point to manage your energy when you've been in, in in this environment where it is so intense on every level, emotionally, physically, mentally, um, it's so intense. And, and when you leave that and you come back to normality and, you know, you're not living in a hotel, all your meals aren't catered for, you, you know, your laundry is not being done by someone. You're not being interviewed by the media. You're not working with mm. diplomats from across yeah, the world. Yeah, there's nothing to fill that space. And you come back and life's back to what it mm. was and you go, well, then how do I find purpose? And, um, and for me it was one of the reasons why I ended up resigning from the police was, uh, you know, I had that time with, uh, with, with Thailand and then I'd worked um, with Interpol and the UN on a two-year secondment to encounter terrorism. And at the end of that two years, I, I was asked where I wanted to go. But to be honest, the reason why I resigned was I went, how do I find purpose back within a role where I've been leading international teams? I've been working, writing uh, counter-terrorism policy for the member countries of Interpol. How do I go back to New South Wales Police and be inspired and motivated by what I was doing. And I guess it was the second time I'd felt that because when I left Tamworth, um, one was because I got a cracking job back in Sydney, mm -hmm. but I was also finding I was getting called out at night to travel from Tamworth to Moree to investigate a stabbing and finding I was spending as much time on the phone as I could to try and talk my way out of having to go. And I go, well, this is not right, you know, just because I've lost almost interest in doing that that's time to move on. So recognising that for me was important too. Mm. And look, I think that's a, a good lesson for anyone on the purpose journey is, is really listening to that voice. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Pete, you've mentioned uh, Thailand. Mm. So I want to take you back to the 26th of December mm. 2004. Your life and, and the lives of many others are changed forever mm. on that day. Are you able to take our listeners on a deep dive into the heart and soul of Peter Baines at that particular point in time? What happened? Who were you? And why was this event so significant in, in igniting your life's work, your legacy? Yeah, cool. So at the time, um, 26th of uh, December, we were, uh, at the time I was working uh, as a detective inspector with New South Wales Police. I was the uh, operations coordinator um, for uh, the forensic area for the state. And uh, it was an incredibly interesting, rewarding uh, job. It was something I'd been doing for um, uh, uh, probably, well, I came back to Sydney in 2002. So two years into this role, was loving it um, and, um, and surrounded by great people I was working with. Um, on the on Boxing Day, we were on holidays uh, down at Sussex Inlet uh, with my family and with a group of um, other families. And um, I think like a lot of Australians, we became aware of it through a news break in the Boxing Day test match and, um, and uh, gathered around the TV at night. And, um, and as the, the scale of what had happened started to to become uh, realised back here, um, there was a night that I guess was the turning point uh, for me. Was we saw the we saw the number of death and uh, saw how that was growing, and uh, the news reports were then identifying Australians affected and so forth. and And there were all these families in this house, and all the parents were watching the TV and. And um, I looked across at my wife and, uh, and we just made eye contact and it was something that we just knew 
our lives were about to change. And I knew uh, from that moment on it would only be a matter of time uh, before I would uh, be heading to Thailand, mm. a country I'd never been before, uh, to um, uh, to work. And, uh, um, and I guess from that point in time, uh, life... Uh, took a took a different direction, and uh, and I reflect back and say, well, the only thing that remained consistent uh, years on was that I have three kids, and uh, because nothing else remained the same mm. in my life um, after that, and uh, never could I have imagined the change that would come about uh, from uh, going to do something which which felt right was right, and uh, but. Uh, resulted in a lot of change and and uh, as we move on 15 years on uh, for me and 15 years ago I was in Thailand mm. uh, today I was there and uh, uh, working with the identification teams and and in that real crisis stage in those early days and um, but you know 15 years on from that um, I think uh, the work that we've done has brought about a lot of positive change for a lot of people. So, Pete, can can you tell me a little bit about the work you were doing on the ground in Thailand? Yeah, so Thailand um, uh, was a humanitarian response. Mm. So in Bali, there were three aspects to the work that was occurring. There was the criminal investigation, there was the scene processing, and then there was, there was the disaster victim identification, so identifying the bodies. That was the work I did in Bali and uh, that was the work that I was taken to Thailand to do. And, um, and in Thailand, obviously, it's a, it's a natural disaster. It's a, our response um, was to identify those who died and to reunite them with their families and send them home. And uh, uh, what we know from the, the tsunami, there was somewhere between 250 and 300,000 people uh, who would lose their lives, and the vast majority of those were in uh, Bandar Aceh in Indonesia, uh, Sri Lanka, and then Thailand. And the work that we did was uh, identifying all of the bodies. Five thousand three hundred ninety-five of them were recovered in in Thailand, and um, th- it's really the only place the international forensic community did that work. And there was just too many in Indonesia and it wouldn't have been a, po- a job that was possible. Uh, Sri Lanka, there wasn't a focus because there wasn't the, the numbers of international um, visitors to the country who lost their lives. And so my role was, uh, uh, was deployed there to uh, lead the teams um, in the identification. We had, there was 450 forensic staff who would work there. They came from 36 different countries and And I guess the big challenge, um, the actual forensic work involved in identifying the bodies is pretty basic forensic science, but the complexity was in the numbers. And when you have 5,395 bodies, no one's prepared for that number. No Mm. one has capacity for that. And and there was an enormous amount learnt by the international forensic science community in how we respond um, after something of that scale and um, we turned up at uh, a temple called Wat Yan Yao and it's where um, the bodies were taken to in Thailand and the natural reaction of when someone dies in Thailand is to take the body to a temple and uh, so they took them to this temple in a place called Takua Pa in the Pang Na province which is about an hour and a half north of uh, Phuket International Airport and um and uh, the bodies were quite literally arriving by the truckload and uh, they were being unloaded and and they were placed on the ground. And, and you know, this temple quickly filled. Uh, there was 3,500 bodies on the ground in this one temple. And uh, So hard to, it's so difficult to even comprehend that. And you know what, Bex, it's a good thing. I often say that it's people say, I can't imagine that. Mm. And I go, that's a good thing. Mm. You don't need to. You don't need to have a visual representation of what three and a half thousand decomposing bodies looks like, let alone smells like. And um, you know the things that advanced decomposition 
of a body is heat and water. Well, these bodies were coming out of the water and they were in the heat of, you know, somewhere in the mid-30s, low 40s mm. and laying on the ground because there was no infrastructure to do this. This is the area of Takyopa is considered a, a country area of Thailand. Even today, they, it's a resort area a bit further south, but it's still just a country area. So the, the, the initial process was to, and it's how do you start? And it's one of the things that the Australians did remarkably well and, and what positioned us um, and the Australians that were there as leaders was they just took action. They just started. And I, it, there's so many lessons that I've taken out of the work that was done in Thailand by so many amazing people and, um, and I share those now. But um, uh, the, the thing was it was about starting. We knew we had good process and we knew that there was an international accepted protocol around how the bodies were to be identified. But that doesn't mean that it all falls into place easily, mm. you know, where you've got, as I say, three and a half thousand decomposing bodies. You've got the complexities that are unfolding um, within the the multinational response that's there dealing with ties and what was going on. You know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of work to be done, um, securing international resources and and maintaining the resources as the, you know, there was an international commitment there for 13 months. And um, uh, one of the challenges was that as some of the countries were identifying their last uh, nationals who had been lost, they were pulling out. Mm. But you go, well, there's a lot of work to, to be done. We need to stay. And uh, because the Thai police, the Royal Thai police, they were uh, occupied with what we call community policing, restoring the the, the order and law and, and they lost so many people as well and and really the skill set in DVI wasn't known um, in Thailand at the time and it was something the Australian Federal Police did a remarkable job of was in building capacity within the uh, Southeast Asian region uh, following uh, that work but uh, at that point in time it was something that there was a heavy reliance upon the Australians so so that was our role. We were working in the early days, incredibly long days, and um, you were basically um, uh, uh, processing bodies, which means mm. doing an identification, uh, doing a post mortem, uh, collecting uh, DNA, fingerprints, and uh, uh, dental uh, records and samples that were then uh, a comparative analysis. So that's a multi phased approach. Half of it occurs back where the country where the person's come from. We collect information, then there's information collected through the post-mortem and then the forensic specialists work at bringing that identification together. And as I say, it's not complex forensic science, but when you have thousands of bodies and tens of thousands of records, then it becomes a records management uh, exercise. And as a leader, how do you inspire your team to stay motivated and on task when you're dealing with like such a momentum, momentous job? Um, you know, and I'm not going to go right into that right now. And, and if our listeners want to learn about that, I'm sure they can go and see your keynote. Mm -hmm. um, it was a tragic turning point for you, for Thailand, for the world. Mm. But there were some beautiful things that came out of that experience. And one of those beautiful things was Hands Across the Water, mm. which you founded 15 years ago now. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Hands Across the Water has been dedicated to enriching the lives of disadvantaged children and communities in Thailand. 100% of all donations go directly to the kids and the community. And the mission of Hands is to give kids a life of choice. Talk me through exactly how Hands do that. Yeah, so um, I started Hands with a colleague from the UK. Uh, we'd met this group of kids and... It wasn't a significant turning point. I didn't feel this compulsion to do something. Mm. I'd always seen victims of um, these type of incidents. This was just bigger, but met these kids. And and then um, Jill from the UK who I was working with, she said to me, you know, we should do something about this and they need a home. I said, okay. And she was in the UK. I was back in Australia. And we said, let's try and raise some money. And um, uh, so we started Hands and... 
Hands Across the Water was was formed with the purpose of um, building a home for the kids. And uh, naively, I thought, well, once we've done that, the job will be done and that'll be it. And and I held that um, level of ignorance until I went over there and opened the first home. And it was driving away from there that I then went, well, what happens now? And how do these kids, uh, how are they supported? How are the family supported? Are the staff? And and uh, quickly realised the job had just just started. And uh, and as you say, it'll be 15 years in October since we, we started that. And when I started Hands in Australia, I was working with the police, so I didn't need to take any income. And I was the only one, so there was no expenses. And and how I raised the money was I was speaking at conferences and being paid to do so. And those funds that I was paid became the income source for the building of the first home. And uh, and uh, that worked fine. And, and therefore, 100% of what I was being paid was going into um, to support the, the growth of, um, of hands. And, and, um, and it was a number of years on that I realised how much the supporters um, liked that position. They liked the fact that 100 cents in the dollar was going there. But, you know, you can only do that for so long before you, um, you, you know, you can only rely on pro bono accounting and mm. legal and auditing and for so long. And, um, and how do you market and grow and then employ staff without resourcing? And how do you maintain that position? And so in 2011, um, we're then, you know, well into hands and, and I realised that uh, uh, I wasn't going to be able to maintain that 100 cents in the dollar and grow. We were holding uh, dinners, for example, and I was ringing people I know six months out saying, buy a ticket so, or buy a table so I can get your funds to make a deposit. And you go, you can't operate like that. But I also didn't want to compromise 100 cents in the dollar. So we formed a company uh, which is now called uh, Hands Group. Now, Hands Group undertakes its own commercial activities, doesn't rely upon donations, it undertakes its own commercial activities, and um, and mainly through uh, what's called the Future of Leadership, this uh, conference series that goes out to, uh, we're all around Australia now, and, um, and we provide um, a day of leadership to people who come along and pay a commercial mm. rate to be there. They're not making a donation. We don't, it's not promoted as a hands event. It's future of leadership. Now, Hands Group undertakes these activities, generates its own income, and Hands Group meets all of the administrative costs of the charity here in Australia. So we now employ a very small team, but they're employed through Hands Group so a true social enterprise, and then the profits uh, and the, the mission for them is generate funds for the charity. So if someone makes a donation to us, 100% of that goes to the kids and the communities in Thailand mm-hmm. because all of the administrative costs, all of our staff costs are covered through Hands Group. And I have to say, um, as someone who works in the speaking industry, you tend to hunt down some of the best up-and-comers in the business, in addition to some of um, some of Australia's leading thought leaders, it's a great lineup every year. Yeah, it, it is. It's um, you know, it's really humbling to have some of the support from, as you say, some of the the icons of the Australian speaking industry mm. who give up their time, turn away commercial work, and and come and speak at our event. Mm. But um, as you know from being involved in the industry, part of the magic is also unearthing. A new talent and um, each year we've been able to do that and I'm really excited about 2020 with some new talent that we've got who I would suggest people on the Australian circuit haven't seen before. Mm. We've got a couple of amazing speakers uh, out of New Zealand and, and it's this real return of value to those that come. They're not coming to support a charity event. Mm. They don't know it's that that's where the profits go. But all of the speakers donate their time. They pay their costs to be there. They get the benefit because then they get booked because we've got such a good audience. We get such good speakers. So there's that commercial return for them. But the audience is just coming because it's a cracking lineup. And this is a beautiful segue to my next point because as much as you're an incredible philanthropist, in my opinion, along with your team, much of your success with Hands has come from the application of an entrepreneurial mindset. 
You're a leader in life and in business and your ability to think and act strategically, in my opinion, is what has enabled you to position both yourself and hands in a way that not only fulfills a purpose, but it also creates prosperous and profitable outcomes for the community in Thailand, but also the business community here in Australia who support hands. So there's a real sense of creating shared value. Now, I personally feel that last year there was a lot of talk about purpose in business, whether you look at the uh, business roundtable in Washington actually shifting the purpose of business away from uh, the shareholder to the stakeholder as one example, or Larry Fink's letter to CEOs, which was all about profit and purpose. But that said, talk is talk. Mm. Taking action is is a completely different thing. So while I think uh, for startups it's a little easier to start with purpose and, and to create a pathway forward, what about the big corporate giants out there? How do you begin to turn those big ships around to refocus on purpose as a part of a business strategy? Yeah, and I think the, um, the appeal to that and it's uh, – um, all the work I do from a business consulting point of view and mm. the, you know, the essence of why I wrote the second book that I did is, is as a charity, uh, I learned that, uh, very quickly we had to do something different and, uh, to raise money and we've got to raise $2.5 million a year. Um, we had to find a way to be relevant other than just be through compassion, just because we were doing a good job. And, you know, and no point is it more important than what we've seen um, in the last couple of months here in Australia with the bushfires and the outpouring of generosity and support to uh, to the Australian communities. And the the question that uh, uh, that I've had to deal with and and address is well, the, our commitments in Thailand, the medicine that we're providing that keeps the kids with HIV alive, the food, the education. We can't put that on hold uh, because it's now difficult in Australia. But how do we raise funds where people are going, I have a budget, be it a be it an enterprise, be it a large business, small business or a family or an individual who say, well, I support charity and this year I've supported uh, the Rural Fire Service or WISE or all of those wonderful organisations. And, and I acknowledge that, but that doesn't change our commitments in Thailand. Mm. As I said, we can't pause our commitments over there. We can't say to the kids, stop eating for a couple of months. You, know, you have to go without medicine. So we had to find a way. And and this has been, I guess, the something that I learned very early on. And, and it was about providing value back to those who invest in us. Now, that value comes in very different ways. But then when I take that into the business consulting, and it's not about hands, it's just about the the, the method, I guess, is that it's about turning uh, corporate social responsibility or if that's a language we want to use into a profit center. So most organizations and people and so forth who support charity and community, it really, it's, it's a philanthropic approach and mm. they might say they have CSR, but if it's a cost center to the business, the risk is when the economy becomes a bit hard, when uh, the balance sheet starts to not look too healthy. As an organisation, we look to cut costs. Yeah. As a family, if we're, uh, things are tight, we cut costs and often the first to go is charity. And uh, so we had to find a way and that became the basis of what I do with organisations is turning that support into a profit centre because then if it's bringing uh, in engagement, if it's improving morale, if it's bringing new business, if it's retaining your best clients – all of those measures, if that's working for you, well, then you're not going to cut it. And that's been our success and our growth. And we look at the, the business relationships, the corporate support that we have, then right down to the individual riders. The reason that so many people are associated and support hands is because what they get out of it. Mm. You know, part of what we do is build strong communities. And that doesn't, that's not limited to Thailand. Mm. We're building well, strong communities. That's what you do so beautifully. Building strong communities within organisations. Mm. We're building strong communities here in Australia, in New Zealand. And, of course, we're building strong communities in Thailand. So I think for charity to survive, for charity to grow, we can't, the sector can't just rely on the fact they're doing good work. Mm. You know, there's a level of arrogance within the charity sector is that they should be supported because of the good that they're doing. 
but there's so many charities doing so many wonderful things, we have to find a way to return value to those that are supporting us. Mm. And a lot of organisations and business and individuals say, that's not why I do it. And I go, well, that's just the, the language that's expected and, and people feel uncomfortable to say, I'm going to support hands across the water for this amount of money, but where's the return? But it's in my interest to give them a return yeah. because as an individual or as a business, if you give me X amount of dollars and I bring a greater return to you, well, then the pie you've got to carve out when you look at uh, spreading your, 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 your charity dollars next year, it's grown because I've helped you grow business. Mm. So if we can help contribute to business, they're going to stay. And um, so that's part of uh, what we do. And, and as I said, we had to do it. Uh, I had to learn to do this out of necessity because if we just would have tried to rely on the fact that we're supporting kids from the tsunami and then the work then uh, it's grown a lot, but we never would have had the relevance. We never would have had the, uh, been able to, you know, secure the market share that we have. Mm. And it's also something that takes CSR out of this siloed over there approach to something that's an integral part of the currency running through a business. Yeah, and it doesn't need to be about money. Mm. Like I, I won't bore you with the, a program that I built, but I built a program in Thailand um, for one of the leading hotels over there mm. who had no money to commit to CSR. They, they, a coup had occurred. There are low occupancy rates. But what we used was the expertise of the guests who were staying there on a frequent basis as business guests in mentoring programs for local charities. What it meant was the guests who were staying there actually stayed a night longer at the hotel each visit so they could undertake this mentoring program. So straight away their spend per stay went up 50%. They're not leaving the hotel so you've got customer retention. Mm. They're talking about this so they're bringing new customers. You've got customer attraction. They've got brand differentiation. You've got image. All of this stuff is improved but they didn't put any money into it. And this is where we can do CSR differently when we think about it not just as giving money but how do we grow it, how do we you know, improve the morale of our staff, how do we increase engagement within the workplace, how, how do we attract and retain the best talent. Mm. You know, all gonna, graduates going into jobs these days, people looking at jobs and particularly the millennials are doing a digital interview on the organisation before they decide to apply. So if you're sitting there in HR thinking we've got the best talent, well, you're probably not seeing them because they've looked at your organisation and yeah. said, are you aligned to my values? Is there the opportunity mm. to undertake the community work? Are you supporting the type of organisations I want to be? I want to support? If you haven't got that presence That's right, right. they're not even going to come audit. and knock on your door. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Pete, you've written another 12-month leadership program called The Growth Project, and that's something that you created uh, with a friend of yours, Larry Fingelson, uh, back in 2013. And my understanding of The Growth Project was that the program pairs leaders in charity and leaders in business basically to ignite each other's potential as leaders. Um, can you share with me a little bit about that program and what you've learnt from the intersection between leading in the business world and leading in the non-for-profit space? Yeah, so I guess the growth project, I used to have what I'd call a lot of uh, affirmation coffees mm -hmm. where uh, leaders of small charities would want to catch up and understand how we were making the money that we were doing when we were the size that we were. And uh, and I'd often walk away from these coffee sessions. All we'd done is affirm what both of us suspected. They had an idea around how I operated and what we'd done and how we're making the money. And I had an, under, an idea of the struggles they were facing. And, but in a one-on-one on, uh, one coffee session, you're not going to bring about much change. And, and uh, I guess the turning point was there was a, a young girl who'd started a charity in Uganda and, um, and the model that she had didn't make sense. Uh, her operations here in Australia mm. were too reliant upon her. The operations in Uganda didn't make sense. And... And the turning point was um, a young child, a two-month-old baby had been taken in. They couldn't support it, went back to the community and died because no one wanted it. And I looked at mm. that charity and went, I could see, not from arrogance but just from experience as to what she needed to do to grow the organisation. But I went, I can't take on another charity myself, <clears throat> excuse me, when I'm trying to run, raise money for my own charity. Mm. 
And uh, talking with Larry in the early days, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to develop uh, a program that supports charity leaders and gives some education, not, you know, not in a master's program where you go and get qualified, but giving people the practical experience around what you need to do to grow a small charity. And, um, and you know, his wisdom was, uh, um, what about uh, rather than one-to-one, one-to-many? And I went, perfect. And we looked at the CEO Institute Tech and all of these organisations that support one another. And, um, and that was the start of the growth project. We did a lot of research to see if there was something that already existed, something that was training small um, emerging charities. And it was never about helping people set charities up. There's enough of them. It was about helping those who have already got a reliance uh, just do business better. Mm. and uh, how to fundraise, how to uh, have engagement, how to communicate, how to tell stories. And so that became the, the growth project and um, um, provided a lot of support and, and um, you know, those opportunities for both business and not-for-profit. Mm. So, Pete, we're coming to the end of the podcast, but I have two quick questions yeah. for you before we get to the end. While uh, we're on the subject of, of diving into leadership growth, I've personally felt that the pursuit for a purpose is often what will propel us as individuals to grow, to change, to transform. Um, And sometimes that requires getting really honest and letting go of habits and beliefs and emotions or whatever it is that's not serving us anymore. What's your advice to, to the listeners out there seeking a deeper connection to purpose in order to level up as a leader or just a leader in life? Yeah, I guess it's just um, a part of it is um, we lead these bike rides in, in mm. Thailand and and um, they're 800 kilometres over eight days and, and I've done uh, 30 of them now and uh, they're remarkable experiences and, and I often hear from people who are hearing about this for the first time where they say, I could never do that because of the fundraising is too high, I couldn't do it, or I could never ride that far. Mm. And the thing that uh, I've certainly seen in the hundreds of people, thousands of people that are ridden with, ridden with us over that time is that often what the story you tell yourself is correct. So true, so isn't if, it? <laughs> if, if you're sitting there saying, I can't, I won't be able to raise that money, I go, you're probably right. Yeah. You know, and if you're saying I, I I couldn't ride that far, I go. If that's the story you're telling yourself, you're there probably you go. right. You just pin that on the wall. But if, conversely, when you say I can do this, well, of course you can, mm. and uh, um, and we see that. And, there, and I have a saying for our riders: it's uh, um, people once they've made the commitment, they say, um, have they got hills? They want to know about the hills, and and I have this saying to them: don't ride the hills before you get there. You know, and uh, and in life we worry about stuff. I love that. We That's worry, gold. We worry about stuff and, <laughs> you know, like on the bike you, you, you'll come over, you'll crest, you'll see this hill and the worry and two things can happen. You might have someone standing at the bottom telling you to turn left and you don't have, uh, have to climb the hill or it just looks worse than it is and you get the momentum and you find yourself three quarters of the way up there before you've found this hill. So... You know, it's um, it's something I, I say to our riders is don't ride the hills before you get there. Don't let this the thought of hills worry you. And uh, so I guess it's the same for, for purpose is um, just find what's most important and find what uh, really excites you and, um, and then find a way to pursue that. Mm. So, Pete, in a conversation about turning points, here in Australia since September, we have gone through probably one of the most devastating turning points in recorded history for our country. And I know that you and your beautiful wife, Claire, were also personally affected by the Australian bushfires. Pete, given your experience in crisis management uh, as a leader and as a leader of those who lead, what is your advice? How do we as Australians rebuild, recover and restore our faith in the creation of a better tomorrow? So I guess that depends upon the level of impact and, mm. uh, you know, those that have lost everything, those who have lost uh, um, a family or so forth, it's uh, obviously a longer journey. And, uh, and I think the, um, the, the thing to, to, to do is to start and to get some wins and start to take pride in, 
in what you've got and uh, and and what can you do that makes you feel as though you've had a victory that day. Mm. And um, that became really clear to me working in Japan after the tsunami and uh, the pride that they had in their communities. And um, the greatest example is I, I spent time in this school and the school, because of structural damage from the earthquake, uh, was to be demolished. But before the school was to be demolished, the students were in there cleaning it. And it was the pride that they had and the, the sense of accomplishment. And And I think that um, if we can do um, little things uh, well, they end up leading to having done big things. Mm. And uh, it takes me back to sitting on a step uh, overlooking the 3,500 bodies at Wat Yan Yao and one of Australia's leading pathologists said, all we can do here is a token effort because it's so big. But out of that 5,500 bodies, uh, 5,000 were identified, which is much more than a token effort. And it's about um, just getting those small victories and uh, mm. doing it one step at a time. And and I think, you know, just back to your question around the fires, I think the other really important thing is as a community is not to forget too quickly. And uh, because we're exposed to this type of stuff, you know, the sad thing is those of us here in metropolitan areas, be it Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, wherever, if we haven't been directly affected, make no mistake, as soon as, the, as, soon as we get some cooler weather, this haze lifts and we've got clear skies and, and there's some rain, we'll forget. Mm. But, you know, the work that I've done, um, you know, around the world, people don't move on when you lose families. You learn to, or you don't move on too quickly. You learn to, to cope with your new reality. And I think the biggest thing that we can do is as, as communities is because we haven't been personally affected here in Sydney, for example, is, is not to think that the challenges faced are gone and find a way to support those who need support. So, Pete, how can we, how can we help? How can we donate? How can we get on a bike? Where can we go and see you speak? Yeah. How can we get involved? <laughs> well, if you want to come to Thailand, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> We'd love to come, come to Thailand. Come and ride a bike. Yeah. And, and I guess all of the information that we've spoken about with hands is just through handsacrossthewater.org.au is uh, is where you can find us. And uh, and whether it's us or whether it's doing something, I think that there's a, there's a greater sense of purpose that comes when you do something for someone else without looking for that return, mm. which almost is contrary to what I said before. But um, um, when you find that you're doing something really meaningful, it brings so much return to you, um, which is the outcome of, uh, of growing as an individual. So whether it's on a bike in Thailand or whether it's taking your holidays down in Bateman's Bay next year, um, it's not about money. It's not always about uh, giving something. Uh, but a big part of it's about being present. Pete, thank you for joining me today on the podcast and, and living your purpose so well and giving us the answers. Um, I know how busy you are and I've enjoyed every moment of today's conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. It's been great to chat. Thanks, folks. <laughs>